Hello there. The tool is the method, and the method is the tool. Yeah. Apophaticism, via negativa, disubjectification. This is a word that you never heard in school. You never heard it in college either. You never heard of the term apophaticism. You never heard of, most likely, via negativa. Not this, not that. That's not a statement, because saying that this is not the soul, and that's not the soul, and that's not the soul. You know, those declarative statements, which are merely words and empirical statements, you know, that's, that's superficial. The point is, is that one has to, at the level of pure subjectivity, identify that these are not myself and disobjectify, disobjectify from the psychophysical and empirical persona non grata. This is the identification phenomenology of seeing self in what is not self. What's the difference between a flashlight and a laser? Well, one's coherent light and one's not coherent light. Well, that's, that's a superficial statement. While accurate, it doesn't actually make a correct statement. Obviously, anything this white... Imagine there's no lights on in this room, other than, you know, of course, this one. You know, the white light on uh, my tattooed hand, yeah? I think you could see the red colors of the flower, and the yellow, and the blue of the water, and the green of the leaves, right? The white light... Yes, in this case, just LED light. The white light takes upon, i.e., the consubstantiality, we could say in the loose terms, identification. Anyway, it takes upon the characteristics of the nature of the skin pigments, right? So when this white light actually hits the red pigment of my tattoo ink, it actually goes into the camera lens, and then you, of course, are seeing red light. You're seeing green light. Imagine, like I said, this is the only light source in the room, right? Consubstantiality. In other words, this red light and this green light goes no further than my skin, right? Because this is white light, correct? There's no green and red. Of course, we could talk about breaking down white light into its constituent components, like, you know, light from the sun. But that's called taking the analogy too far, right? So let's not go there. Anyway, so the white light actually takes upon the nature, the characteristics of the pigments, because the red pigment in my skin is obviously absorbing all uh, ends of the frequencies of the white light that's being emitted, uh, the entire spectrum of the white light that's being emitted from this flashlight, except for red frequency wavelengths, which actually go towards the camera lens. The same is true of the green and the blue, right? So the blue and the green and the red go no further than my hand, right? If I take away my hand, just white light, right? So, everything begins here, so far as the red, the green, and the blue. Is that really simple? That would be the consubstantiality, right? So, what's the difference between this white light? Let's say they're both the same power. This is like a 500 milliwatt. This is a lot more powerful than that one. What's the distinction? We say, well, what's laser light? Well, laser light specifically is point source light. We can say, and this is uh, highly applicable to this nearly perfect analogy, that, of course, laser light is coherent. What do we mean by coherent? Everybody's heard the term coherent a million times throughout their life in college and, you know, physics class and whatnot, but what are we talking about when we're talking about coherency? We're talking about self-similarity, right? It'd be the same as a vortex. You ever, well, a spiral. A spiral, of course, is just a two-dimensional vortex. Let's actually draw in our minds a spiral. And, of course, it just keeps going out and out. It never reaches itself, right? Kind of like a shell, right? It just continues to grow and grow. And, of course, the infinite is nothing other than the uh, false mirage or the mirror of uh, the one or the agathon, the infinite, right? Infinite growth, infinite becoming. It never reaches itself. What would be the disobjectification from infinite becoming? Because identification with the existential self, i.e. the persona non grata, i.e. the empirical self, yeah, the psychophysical self, is an endless spiral. If you actually set that spiral askew through disobjectification with that object, then it becomes back in line with itself. It becomes self-similar. Let me repeat that term again, self-similarity. Now, does the red laser light from this actually take on the characteristics of the blue and the green pigments of my hand? I'm pretty sure, pretty sure it doesn't, you know? 
the red remains red no matter where it actually passes over my hand. Isn't that the case? You know, the red laser light on my blue shirt, still red. Yeah, self-similarity. Self-similarity. So what's the distinction? Light is light. What do we talk about when we're talking about coherency? What is the purpose, the tool, the methodology for disobjectification? What would it effectuate? There's a great word everybody should learn. Effectuate. What would be the purpose of that? What is disobjectification by principle? Not just as a tool for apophatic retroduction, but the very methodology of theosis itself, i.e. theurgy, i.e. synthesis, that the Indians called samadhi, which comes from the word jhana, i jayati, to burn. Yes, to burn what? To burn away objectivity. Disobjectification is the methodology of burning, analogously in the Indian analogy, burning away. You know, what is not the, the actually one great parable that's uh, found both in the Upanishads and in the Nikayas would be people uh, bringing out gold ore. How do you extract the gold? You have like a bunch of gold in your hand, but you really don't have it because what is potential is not actual. What's the difference between what is potential and what is not actual? Well, fundamentally, an, an acorn and a giant oak tree that's like 100 years old, they're both genetically, vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis their DNA, identical. But can you get like 100 feet of board lumber out of an acorn? If an acorn and an oak tree are absolutely identical, what's the difference between potentiality and actuality? What's the difference between having like a, you know, a million pounds of gold a hundred feet underneath your house? It's like, are you rich? Well, no, you're not, because what is potential is not actual. People always ask the question, like, well, if I'm always of the self, have a self, of course, is also wrong because that implies possession, like one thing has something else. Nobody has a soul because it implies possession. A radio doesn't have a signal. The signal is coincident to the radio. A body doesn't have a soul in it. That's not a denial of the soul. There are no little people inside the TV set either, right? What is coincident to? What is the consubstantiality of the incoherent nature of one's being in the ontology of metaphysics that is the basis of empirical, not only empirical suffering, but ontological suffering, which of course is primordial. Um, the term of course is avidya or avidya. Pali or Sanskrit makes no difference. It's the same distinction between light and illumination. The nature of light is that it illuminates. It actually goes or leaves itself. It is not uh, self-similar. It is not self-similar in that it takes upon the attributes of what it is not. Just like this white light you know, takes upon the nature of the red pigment and the blue pigment and the green pigment. This light is not self-similar. No, it will take upon itself and identify, if we're going to personify the light, you know, take the analogy a little further, it will identify with whatever it takes upon itself. This, however, does not. This does not take upon itself the characteristics of anything. It's still the self-similar light of the laser, correct? Don't take the analogy too far. Let's not talk about actually point source light because we don't need to get the analogy that far. The consubstantiality of existence that is the basis of primordial ignorance, ignorance or nescience. And I don't mean ignorance inside the head, but I mean actually talk about metaphysical ignorance or nescience. This objectification is going from this to this. Yeah, and it's not directly so. You don't go immediately from this to this. It is a process. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. You actually have to cultivate it. Yeah, you can sit there watering the dirt, right? But you're not going to grow anything unless you plant some seeds. And you know what the hell you're doing. Cultivation obviously so is necessary. Anyway, the, to understand the consubstantiality of characteristics of the metaphysical self in its identity of seeing self and what is not self. Anyway, I talked about the spiral and the circle and uh, being self-reflexive. You know, disobjectification pulls oneself off of a bottomless spiral and you naturally fall into, the self falls into itself. You know, it's not like something is reached, so you don't fall from one self into another. You have to actually understand this from a loose sense that you return to that which you naturally are.
by getting off the spiral of perpetual becoming, or as the ancient Pali is called bhava nubhava, which means becoming and again becoming, which is not only merely uh, this life, but uh, all existence itself. And existence is a great word in English. English words for metaphysics are pretty horrible, but existence is a good one, because existence means exostance, which literally means to be outside of yourself, or other than yourself. To see yourself as something which you are not. Existence itself, by definition, is not who you are. Or as they say in the old Sanskrit, tattvamasi. Or as in the Pali, aham brahmasmi. Or I am Brahman, which means the absolute. Not Brahman like a god or something like that. People are so confused and stupid, they think, oh, it's Brahman god. No, 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 no. It's the word in Pali means the same thing as the Greek word agathon, or the absolutes. The summum bonum. Ahura Mazda, there you go. You can call it by a hundred different names, but... What does it mean for oneself to take on the characteristics of that which you are not? This is the definition of false identity. Because the self or soul, the ontological self or soul, takes upon itself the attributes and characteristics which is of that which is perpetually in transience. Always becoming, but never itself, as the old saying goes. Let me repeat that. Always becoming, but never itself. Because anything that has a beginning has an end. And what is endless is ignorance. But ignorance has to be cultivated. Ignorance is both primordial and it's cultivated. You either don't care and you know you just perpetual perpetual suffering, which is the definition of hell, by the way. The real definition of hell. Or you can actually cultivate self similarity. Disobjectification is going from this to this. Yeah. Not directly so. You don't immediately go from here to here. But I mean, that's what disobjectification is. That's what apophaticism is. That's what via negativa is. That's what neti neti is. Isokaya nami sata. None of these things, this body is my soul, myself. There's always, of course, two selves in all forms of monistic metaphysics. The empirical self, i.e. the persona non grata, Bob, Sue, Larry, and then the actual self. This reflexive self, like these idiot Buddhists are always translating, you yourself are the refuge. Well, the Pali doesn't say that, you pathetic, knuckle-dragging mental midget it says the soul is the refuge it doesn't there's this reflexive crap they love because buddhists most buddhists they think that there's no soul in the original doctrine but atasarana nanasarana the soul is a refuge with none other is a refuge the only thing that's called uh, immortal and eternal is the soul this notion of this no soul nonsense is not doctrinally valid it's complete hogwash the termanata is said of things which are not the soul. If I said this is not the soul and that's not the soul and this is not the soul, would you therefore conclude that there was no soul? Well, if you're an idiot, you would. But I didn't say that. What I was doing is trying to engage your damn mind to say this is not the self, this is not the self. And what that does is it works your way back from this to this. The teaching is also the methodology. If there were no soul... You would never say, this isn't the soul, that isn't the soul, this isn't the soul. You would say, there ain't no soul. <laughs> Boom, it's over with. That passage doesn't exist anywhere in any effing translation, period! Said the brilliant tattooed bull guy that's been translating Pali for over 20 years. And is a lot smarter than any so-called frigging Buddhist out there. And there is no soul in Buddhism. Buddhism teaches anatta. I was like, do you know what the term anatta means? Yeah, it's, it means that there's no soul. I was like... Can you doctrinally validate that pathetic statement? Ah, 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 well, my teacher said, and I'm not asking you what the hell your teacher said, you cross-eyed fool. I'm asking you what actual doctrine itself says. Does it say that there's no soul anyway? Uh, well, <laughs> this is why I don't debate these people anymore. They're so stupid. Very stupid, by the way. So anyway, that's the methodology. And it was a pretty decent analogy because it's hard to analogize principles of metaphysical synthesis. Yeah, i.e. theurgy, i.e. samadhi, i.e. the apophatic methodology of subjective synthesis. That's a really good analogy. 
It's, it's about as good as they come. They're even better than the ancients did. But the ancients didn't have lasers! <laughs> I hope you liked this video. If you did, you can always click the link below. Let me know what you think. Tell me how much you hate me. Whatever floats your boat. Girlfriend. Peace out, Girl Scout. And wait for the Latin. Lux Everitas. Alright. I have no idea what everybody keeps thinking I'm in the Illuminati. It's just completely ridiculous. It's ludicrous. Totally ludicrous. <laughs>